Thank you, Michelle. I really appreciate that story. And Michelle is, is truly a, well, we can't say minute man, minute lady. She didn't find out until Thursday that she had the children's story for today. So we really appreciate it. And didn't you appreciate those songs that were sung and presented to us? How wonderful, how beautiful, how important it is that we indeed turn our eyes on Jesus, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Today I want us to think a little bit about bridges. Um, I asked Charlie this morning if, if he was... Uh, present at the opening ceremony of the Golden Gate Bridge. Charlie said, what? <laughs> the Golden Gate Bridge. No, he didn't remember that. How many of you have seen the Golden Gate Bridge? Let me see your hands. All right, we know where the Golden Gate Bridge is. It's up by San Francisco between the city of San Francisco and Marin County. It goes across the Golden Gate. I remember when, uh, years ago when we sailed for Japan, we sailed out under the Golden Gate Bridge, and uh, what a thrill it was. The Golden Gate Bridge has a very interesting history. Aha, it does work. Thank you. Uh, the Golden Gate Bridge has a very interesting history history, and that is that it was one of the largest expansion bridges when it was built, and the opening ceremony of the Golden Gate Bridge was on May 28 of 1937, and believe it or not, I was there. I still remember it. Now, obviously, I wasn't a very big boy at that time, but I do remember, and I do remember that uh, President Franklin D. Roosevelt cut the ribbon at noon, and traffic began to flow across the Golden Gate Bridge. We had the privilege of driving in that traffic. My dad, my dad and mom and I were there. Uh, we had the privilege of driving in that traffic, we didn't uh, do the pedestrian walk the day before, but the day before, when they had a pedestrian walk across the bridge, over 200,000 people went across the bridge either by walking or on roller skates. You may say, well, well, what are roller skates? Well, they didn't have skateboards at that time. So uh, they used roller skates. Ever since that time, I have been fascinated with bridges. There are all kinds of bridges in this world. There are steel bridges, rope bridges, bamboo bridges, even glass bridges, at least a glass floor in the bridge. But I have been fascinated about bridges. And I often think, if there was only, if there was only a, a modern bridge to cross the, the great gorge of temptation and trial and, and tribulation and blessings that we must walk across in order to have the wonderful promise of Jesus Christ and spending the eternity with Jesus. I often think that would be so wonderful. And I also think that not only are, we, are you and me to be a bridge, 
But Jesus, God, the great architect and engineer and builder of bridges, has made bridges for us. But first of all, I'd like to to direct our attention to the fact that we are also builders of bridges. I have felt that as a commitment in my heart, and that's the reason that I spent 30 plus years in youth ministry, youth work, in local conferences, in unions, and divisions, because of that feeling of responsibility for our young people, our boys and girls. And how important that is. And I want to share a poem with you that I use many times on the cover of youth leadership manuals and so on. It goes like this. An old man going a lone highway came at evening, cold and gray, to a chasm vast and deep and wide. The old man crossed in the twilight dim, The rushing stream had no fear for him, but he turned when safe on the other side and built a bridge to span the tide. Old man, said a fellow pilgrim near, you're wasting your strength with building here. Your journey will end with the ending day. You never again will pass this way. You cross the chasm deep and wide. Why build you the bridge at even tide? The builder lifted his old gray head. Please don't make similarities here. The builder lifted his old gray head. Good friend, in the path I've come, he said, a child whose feet must pass this way, this chasm that has been not to me, To that fair youth may a pitfall be. He too must cross in the twilight dim. Good friend, I'm building this bridge for him. That's a real challenge for each one of us. It's a real challenge for us in the Arlington Seventh-day Adventist Church. A, a, A real challenge to think, how are we mentoring and training our youth? It seems like it's interesting, but mothers have a great affinity for their daughters. And for sons, father is a hero. Uh, Someone was telling me the other day that... uh, their son admired their dad so much, her husband, that dad laid out his clothes uh, for the next day that he was going to wear the next day. And their little son went in his bedroom and he picked out the clothes just like dad's and laid them out, his clothes, (laughs) laid them out so he could match dad. That's the kind of responsibility that you and I have as builder of bridges. Whether it's a son or a daughter, a grandson or a granddaughter, a great-grandson or a great-granddaughter or a great-great-grandson or a great-great-granddaughter, we are to be examples for our young people. I'm sure that most all of us here today have sons and daughters. We may have grandsons and daughters, granddaughters and sons, and we may even have great-granddaughters and sons. Is there anyone here today that has a great-great-granddaughter or grandson? Would you raise your hand? All right, let's go back one. Is there anyone here that has a great-granddaughter or grandson? Yes. Yes. My sweetheart, do you have your hand up? 
<laughs> we have two great grandsons. Whatever it is, we have a responsibility to them. Now, our responsibility is more than just giving them a good time. It's a responsibility of helping them to understand how much Jesus indeed we will be able to demonstrate Jesus love to them our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was the greatest architect and builder of bridges for you for me for our loved ones and for all mankind Jesus Christ Jesus built the bridges over which we can cross over the raging waters of temptation, problems, troubles, challenges, whatever they may be. And Jesus gives us the example in Mark, the 10th chapter, beginning to read with verse 13. Then or disrupting, or, or, or spilling food at the table, or a number of other things. The disciples had missed at that time the real ministry of Jesus. The real ministry of Jesus was to start at the beginning and to minister to all. Whereas the disciples thought that it was just the adults that needed to be ministered to. And so as we read on in the 14th verse, when the disciples rebuked the parents for bringing their children to Jesus, it says, and when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said to them, let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. What a lesson that Jesus used little children to be a lesson to us. Catherine brought uh, little Emma into uh, Sabbath school this morning. Little Emma is so sweet. She's so beautiful. Emma Peabody. Uh, I don't know, is Emma here? Maybe Emma needed to have her diapers changed or uh, needed to eat or something, but Emma is so sweet. And I, I, I just couldn't help but say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for helping me to see little Emma this morning so that I could really feel in depth what I was going to talk about. In, in the 15th verse of Mark, the 10th chapter, Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. Ouch. What? I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. 
And then in verse 16, it says something so sweet, so precious, that tells me so much about Jesus and how Jesus wants us to be. And he, Jesus, took them, took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. My dear friends, what a wonderful missionary opportunity we have in the Arlington Seventh-day Adventist Church to lead our boys and girls, our teenagers, our young people into knowing the true love and blessing of Jesus Christ. But to do that, we have to know Jesus Christ ourselves. Because that is so very, very important. And as we talked about Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, being the greatest architect, the greatest builder of bridges, I would ask you, what personal bridge did Jesus build and personally cross while he was here on this earth? What, what personal bridges did Jesus build? He knew that life, as a human being, he knew that life was filled with deep crevasses of temptation, of danger, of difficulties, raging waters, but he built those bridges so that you and I can walk those bridges and lead our young people along with us, lead our boys and girls, our sons, our daughters, our grandsons, our granddaughters, our great-grandsons, our great-granddaughters along with us across those bridges. And so... I am reminded of, of, of the um, text in John, the 14th chapter and the 6th verse, when Jesus gave the promise, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life for each one of us today. For each one of our sons and daughters, each one of our grandsons and granddaughters, each one of our great-grandsons and great-granddaughters, Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Let's, let's go back and just think for a moment or a little longer than a moment, actually. Think about the bridges that Jesus built and that he crossed successfully to show us that we as human beings, if we let Jesus take us by the hand, we can cross those same bridges. And we, we find that right after, actually right after Jesus' baptism, it says in Matthew, the fourth chapter, right after his baptism, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Ouch. But see, the devil had to have his opportunity. If he didn't, Jesus would not have had the humanity that we have. So the Spirit led Jesus up into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And in verse 2, And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Would you be hungry if you fasted 40 days and 40 nights? That's a long time. And in verse 2 it says, 
And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. In verse 3, Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones become bread. You notice, Satan didn't approach Jesus when he was at his best, so to speak. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not, I'm not defacing Jesus, but I'm saying that Satan comes and tempts us many times when we are most discouraged, when we are most frustrated, even when we are most angry. And so Jesus had fasted 40 days and 40 nights. And then Satan came to tempt him. Well, it's up there, so we'll, uh, we'll use that. It's, it's not on my screen right now, but uh, that's all right. We, we won't worry about that. So I want to talk about the bridge of obedience. The first bridge that Jesus has taught us to cross. The bridge of obedience. And looking at that bridge of obedience, Jesus was led up into the mountains, into the wilderness, when he was at his weakest Satan came and tempted him. When he was hungry, do you know what it's like to be hungry? I don't know what it's like to be really, really hungry, but once in a while I get hungry. When Jesus was really, really hungry, then Satan came and tempted him. The temptation that I see that Jesus faced at that time was a temptation of personal wants and needs. There's no question in my mind but that Jesus needed food after fasting 40 days and 40 nights. The temptation that Satan brought against Jesus at that time was about personal wants and needs. Have you ever been tempted regarding personal wants and needs? Especially when you were desperate, when you didn't know what to do, when you, when you just felt like life just wasn't worth going on. That's when Jesus was tempted, with a time when his personal wants and needs were the greatest. And if, if we look in Matthew chapter 4, in verse 4, it says, but he, Jesus, answered and said, It is written. Notice what Jesus used for, for his defense. What was it? The Bible, the Word of God. That's what he used. And Jesus said, It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of of God. My friends, at the time of greatest temptation is a time when I need to be reading God's word the most. When I'm discouraged, it's a time when I need to be reading God's word the most. And in order to do that, I must be reading God's Word all the time, right? All the time. But remember, the place to go is God's Word. And, and that will help us. Then we go on in Matthew, the fourth chapter. 
and the fifth verse, and it says, Then the devil, Satan, takes him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle or a wing of the temple. Now, the temple was very high. And he put Jesus there. And again, he challenged not only Jesus' authority, but he challenged Jesus' power. Have you ever felt when you were in a dispute with someone, well, I'll show you. Ever had that come into your mind? Ever had that feeling? Maybe I'm the only one that has ever had that feeling. I don't know. But I've had that feeling. Well, I'll show you. I'll show you who I am. I'll show you what I can do. This was the human side of the temptation of Jesus. Satan, the devil, tempted Jesus about his own power. And it says that Jesus, uh, that Satan even went a little further with Jesus, and he said to him, to Jesus, If thou be the Son of God, cast yourself down, for it is written. Now, did the devil know God's word? Oh, yes. The devil knew God's word. He knew it well. And the devil said, for it is written. He sh if, if thou be the Son of God, cast down thyself, for it is written, He, God, shall give his angels charge concerning you, and in their hands they will bear you up, lest at any time you dash your foot against the stone. Jesus, if you're really who you say you are, don't worry about it. Just... Jump off. God will send his angels. He won't let you hit the ground. He won't let you splatter. The angels will save you, protect you. What, what was being tempted here? What bridge was Jesus making for you and me? Pride. Pride. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a downfall. All Satan needed to do was to get Jesus to do one of his commands, and Jesus would have sinned and could no longer have been our Redeemer. And what did Jesus say? In verse 7 of Matthew chapter 4, Jesus said unto him, It is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. When Satan tries to get really near and close to us, when he tries to get inside of us and, and make us frustrated and angry and uh maybe even doubting. Remember, Satan has no power in our lives unless we give him that power. Unless we follow him. Let's follow, my dear friends, the bridge of obedience which Jesus Christ built for you and for me. And then the third temptation is, is very interesting because it says that in verse 8, the devil taketh him up into the exceeding high mountain and showed him all the, of the kingdom of the world and the glory of them. Ah, you can have all this world and all the glory and riches that come with us, with it. And he says to Jesus, All these things will I give you, 
if you will fall down and worship me. Well, Jesus came to redeem the world. So if he came to redeem the world and he was being offered the world and all of its riches and all of its people, wouldn't that seem like a, 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 a logical way, a simple way to redeem the world? But who was asking to be worshipped? Who was asking to be worshipped? Hello? Satan, Satan, that's right. (laughs) Satan was asked to be worshipped. I I call this compromise. Have Have you ever been tempted to compromise? Have you ever been tempted to compromise in God's word? Ever been tempted to compromise in God's way? Ever been tempted to say, well, yes, I know the Bible says this, but, you know, that was way back then, and uh, that doesn't apply to me today. Of course we have. All the time we're tempted to compromise. And Jesus was tempted to compromise for you and for me. Just just think of that. How interesting that would have been. When all the devil was asking was to have Jesus fall down and worship him. That would have been a lot easier than than going through all the agonies and and all the scoffing scoffing and all the the hateful things that were said of Jesus and, and the way the tide went up and down in Jesus' life and then to go to Gethsemane and and pray so hard that as it were there were great uh, great spots of blood on his forehead, but then fully surrender and say, Father, not my will, but your will be done. And then Jesus died on the cross for you and for me. My friends, I I just can't comprehend not only the physical agony of being crucified, but the emotional agony. Were good people crucified when Jesus was crucified? No. Well, you could have answered that question yes or no, I guess. If you were thinking of Jesus, it would be yes, but no, it was not the custom to crucify good people. This was a form of a death sentence for the two thieves that were crucified both on the right hand and the left hand of Jesus. How easy it would have been to just take Satan at at his word, fall down and worship him, and believe in that deception. Because could Satan give Jesus all the world Well, yes and no. He was ruler of the world, but he couldn't give Jesus all the world and and yet let Jesus remain our Savior. And then in verse 10, it says, Then Jesus said to him, to Satan, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. There's no compromise here, is there? It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only 
shall you serve. So we've already seen three bridges that Jesus built for you and for me. The bridge of the temptation of satisfying our personal wants and our personal needs. The bridge of temptation of wanting power in our own lives for our own sake. And the bridge of temptation of having wealth and earthly glory. These are bridges that Jesus built for you and me to walk across that raging tide that is so scary and yet so safe if we're walking on Jesus' bridge. Paul understood this. He understood how hard life was. He understood what it meant to go through persecution, what it meant to be rejected. Remember at uh, Athens he gave this eloquent speech, but there was no result because it was Paul that were t was talking, not God. But later then Paul wrote, and this is so important, no temptation has overtaken you except that is common to man. Let me, let me ask you, does that mean except as was common to Jesus? Are we afraid to answer that question? <laughs> does that mean except that was common to Jesus? It means that, doesn't it? It means that. Except that was common to man. And God will, with the temptation... Also make a way of what? Escape. Escape. That you may be able to bear it. Think of that again. Verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man, but God is faithful. That's an important word, my friends. God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able to stand. Oh, how important it is that we take advantage of these bridges, that we take advantage of the promises in the Word of God. Not that we just read them. Oh, yeah, that's... that's that's nice. That's, yeah, that's nice for the ears, for the eyes. No, that we take them into our hearts and our lives, that we make them part of our life. Because whether we, walk, whether we like it or not, we are having to walk this walk of life, right? Whether it's, it's joyful or whether it's sorrowful, we, we have to walk this walk of life. And God's word is not only to give us direction, but to give us help, support, and comfort in this walk of life. The, the next bridge that I would like to talk about I'd like to have us consider is the bridge of service. This will come on again in a minute or two, so just, just don't worry about it if I move my finger back and forth. The bridge of service. You remember in Matthew, the 28th, uh, 25th chapter, I'm sorry, in Matthew, the 25th chapter, it tells us about where was our, our sweet little girl I could just hand this to 
and, and she would fix it and hand it back. <laughs> That's all right. <clears throat> when I was learning things, there weren't iPads and iPods and so on and so forth. And I'm still trying to get used to them, but I don't know how to fix them when they, when they go bad. Anyway. Oh, it's on the screen. All right. Thank you, Marlo. Marlo is my best friend and bails me out of this tumultuous river of uh, electronics. <laughs> it says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory and in the next verse, and all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from the other as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. And the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world, for I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. Wait a minute. Do you mean to tell us, to, to tell me that Service means to, to not only give food and drink, but to accept strangers and to give clothes and to, to help the sick and even to go into that place like a prison and help people? Do you mean that I should have a positive attitude toward the homeless people? I mean, I'm told that uh, many of the homeless choose to be that way. Now, I, I don't believe that, but what I've been told. Do you mean that service means to help these kind of people? Well, let's read on. In verse 37, and the king will answer, and the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, yes, indeed, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. <clears throat> Do you mean that? Uh, if I stop and help a, a homeless person who really doesn't, how can I say this in a nice way? I'm just going to say it. Doesn't smell too good. Doesn't speak very good English. Doesn't look like they really want to work. Do you mean that that is helping Jesus? Is that helping Jesus, yes or no? Yes. yes. Because John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, he gave his only Son, that whoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent his Son into the world to condemn the world. No, thank you. God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. <clears throat> Do you mean this person here that's pushing this cart, this grocery cart that they probably stole from, from uh, some grocery store with all kinds of rags and stuff in it, pushing it? You mean that, that Jesus came to say that person?
Do we really believe that? Jesus did. If we believe God's word, Jesus did. So the bridge of service is so very, very, very important. And remember, go back to the illustration of the sheep and the goats. The sheep were on the right-hand side, the goats were on the left-hand side, and Jesus said this to the sheep, and they said, when, when, did you, when did you do this? When did we do this for you, Jesus? Then he explained, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you gave me clothes. When I was in prison, you came to visit me. You didn't look down on me and reject me. You helped me. And because of that, you are my sheep. Dear friends, this is such an important bridge in our lives. Our bridge of service that Jesus Christ himself built for you and for me. Did Jesus only help, uh, how can I say this? Did Jesus only help the upper class when he walked this earth? No, actually he helped those for which he was criticized in helping. I think of the woman taken in adultery and all these men tried to uh, criticize Jesus because he was even talking to this person. And yet, if I understand God's word correctly, all of these men had been involved in her sinking to this depth. And when she raised her head, Jesus said, where are your accusers? They were gone. Jesus said, neither do I accuse you, neither do I judge you. Go and sin no more. Oh, my friends, we as Seventh-day Adventists are not to be elitist. And yet sometimes we sort of give that impression, don't we? Well, <clears throat> see, we have the truth, and so we're better. We're better than you. Um, no, we don't need your books. We, we have the truth. Well, I'm, I'm not denying that we have the truth. What I'm saying is we have to be careful not to be elitist, not to feel that we are better than other people, not to feel that we are closer to God than other people, not to feel that we will be saved because we're a Seventh-day Adventist, but, 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 but you Baptists, no, no, sorry. Jesus is going to leave you out. No, my friends, service, and service to those who are less fortunate than we are. Then the last bridge that I would like us to think about is the bridge of prayer. Prayer and supplication. And if we look in our Bibles to Philippians, the fourth chapter, verses 6 and 7, we find here a very, very important message. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, be, don't be concerned about anything, but in all things by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be known to God. Is the bridge of prayer important? So very, very important. Yes, you're right. 
Yes, so very, very important. The bridge of prayer, the bridge of communication, the bridge of not only talking to God, but listening to God, listening to his still small voice, listening to his direction. So very, very important. And in verse 7 of, of chapter 4 of Philippians, it says, And the peace of God, which pass all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Shall keep your hearts and minds from what? From becoming discouraged? From falling into temptation? from all those things which Satan would bring against us. And how can we do that? By walking across the bridge of prayer. Oh, how important this is. Do you see why I have been, ever since I was a little boy, I'm not going to tell you how old I was when the Golden Gate Bridge opened, but you can sort of guess. Uh, do you see how, why I'm fascinated with bridges? Not only the material bridges, but the spiritual bridges that God has built for you and for me. How important that is. The bridge of prayer. Let's look back at uh, Luke, the 21st chapter. Luke chapter 21, beginning to read with verse 34. But take heed to yourselves, lest your heart be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness. Well, we don't do that. Well, what's this third thing? Cares of life. Does your heart get weighed down sometimes with the cares of life? Mine does. I'll admit that. Mine does. But it says in God's word in Luke, but take heed to yourselves lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing drunkenness and cares of this life and that day, the coming of Jesus, come on you unexpectedly. And in verse 35, for it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. However, I like verse 36. Watch therefore and do what? Pray. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and that you will stand before the Son of Man. Watch, therefore, and pray. I am so thankful that Jesus built the bridge of prayer for you and for me to walk across, to be able to endure, to be able to withstand, the raging torrents of this life. And one of the raging torrents of this life is to be so caught up in the cares of this life that our minds and our hearts don't have room for Jesus. And so, my dear friends, I would encourage each one of us to remember the bridge of obedience the promises of God, the, the bridge of service, and the bridge of prayer. And think of them not just as something that you heard about on, on um, August 10 in the Arlington Seventh-day Adventist Church, but think of them where they really came from. 
from the word of God. And with that, we will respond to Jesus' love. And we will take advantage of those bridges which Jesus already built for you and for me so that we could walk across those raging torrents of the cares of this life and look forward to the wonderful blessings of time eternity with Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love, your kindness, your care. Thank you for giving your only son, Jesus Christ, to come to this world and take on the same humanity that we have and to withstand those temptations of Satan, those temptations that would have nullified Jesus' role as a savior. And thank you for the bridges of which we've only talked about three today, the bridge of obedience, the bridge of service, the bridge of prayer. And right now, we just give our hearts and our lives to you. And our eyes are shut, but your eyes are open. If you would like to rededicate your hearts and your lives to Jesus, would you raise your hand right now? Just keep them raised. Jesus, you see our hands. You know that we're sincere. You know that we re are rededicating our hearts and our lives to you right now. Thank you for accepting us. And thank you for walking with us from this, your house, across the bridges that you have built, that we might soon know joy and happiness and peace forever and ever in your heavenly kingdom. Thank you, Lord, not only for seeing our hands, but for accepting our rededication or our dedication to you. Thank you for accepting us. In Jesus' name, amen. May God bless us as we go now to the potluck. And don't forget to tell Luella, happy birthday. That's right. <laughs>